It's time for America Outdoors Radio, the show that covers the outdoor scene across the U.S. of A. and the entire continent. Fishing, hunting, conservation, outdoor recreation, and great destinations, we cover it all every week. It's your country, your outdoors. Let's explore it together with your host, John Cruz. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. That's the opening line from Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities, a book you may or may not have been assigned to read when you were in school, but it's also a line that describes fishing and hunting opportunities around our nation. For example, in the Pacific Northwest, it's the worst of times when it comes to Chinook salmon returns. Numbers have been on the decline for several years now and don't seem to be any better this year thanks to a blob of warm water that sat up in the Gulf of Alaska from about 2012 through 2015 and affected the forage base for the salmon that swam up there from California, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia to grow bigger. On the bright side, that blob dissipated, and we are starting to see better forecasts for some species this year, namely coho salmon, also known as silvers, which are expected to come back in huge numbers this summer off the Pacific Northwest coastline. When it comes to birds, pheasant numbers suffered in several states, especially Montana in the winter and spring of 2018. And the late winter many folks across the West are seeing this year isn't helping matters at all. Other states, though, like Iowa, saw huge numbers of ringnecks last year. And the state DNR counted higher numbers in eight out of nine areas of the Hawkeye State. Not only that. But quail and cottontail numbers were up as well there, too, last year. And then there are turkey. Turkey hunting, whether it happens in the spring or fall, is becoming increasingly popular across the country as gobblers establish themselves in every state of the Union except for Alaska, where you get to hunt for ptarmigan instead. When it comes to turkey, though, There are several species to hunt in the rest of the United States, and in the West, their numbers, by and large, are growing. In the eastern U.S., though, it's a different story that's unfolding, and Will Brantley, the hunting editor for Field & Stream magazine, is going to join us this hour for a discussion about where turkey numbers are declining, and more importantly, what might be causing this drop in turkey numbers. Sticking with wild birds, we'll also talk to Alicia Harden with Nebraska Game and Parks. They are promoting the chance to complete an upland slam this fall in the Cornhusker State. In addition to pheasant, they've also got bobwhite quail, prairie chicken, and sharp tail grouse. Register for the program and bag all four in one season, and you'll not only get a certificate proclaiming your accomplishment, but... Also be entered for one of several great prizes they'll be giving away again this year. We've got some fishing for you too this week, and it's taking place somewhere sunny and warm. Your launching point is H&M Landing out of San Diego, California, and Frank Ursetti, the general manager at this historic landing, will tell you about the great saltwater sport fishing you can enjoy there this spring for a few hours or for a couple of days. Before we get into all of this, though, I've got to tell you, I was at another sportsman show recently, and once again, I found a new and innovative item that I think you're going to love, especially if you hunt and hike in the backcountry and it starts to rain. Next up on America Outdoors Radio, we've got a product review for you. Now, if you've been to sportsman shows, especially around the western U.S. this year, you may have noticed a monster truck outside some of these shows, and it's got something written on it, Rockman, R-O-K-M-A-N. And this company doesn't sell monster trucks, but they sell some really impressive packs and modular systems that you, as a backcountry hunter, or backcountry backpacker, or any sort of other outdoors enthusiast is going to love. With us here to tell you more about it is the president and founder of the company, Zach Hillman. Zach, welcome to the show. How are you today? Well, Zach, I'm doing great, and let's just start off with the one thing that separates your product from so many other ones out there. Yours is waterproof, and that's simply not the case for just about any other hunting backpack or hiking backpack out there. Correct. Yes. When we uh, one of the big common factors that we found with uh, most of our backpacks is that they they weren't waterproof, and so inside our packs are our lifeline, 
you know, we got our fire starters, our, our clothes, our gear to keep us safe and keep us in that uh, going in the back country. And so when we set out to build this, it, the number one feature is it had to be waterproof. So all your packs here, gunmetal gray, which is actually, believe it or not, folks, a really good color to have out there in the country. Do you have camo as well? We don't. We don't do camel because we have a very wide demographic. So we've got everybody from mountain bikers using them to hikers, campers, hunting, fishermen. So it's a very neutral color. It looks like a rock when it's out there. So if you're worried if it has to be camel, don't worry about that. It's very neutral. Well, there you go. We just solved the riddle of why it's called Rockman, folks. But let's talk more about these packs because in addition to the fact that they're waterproof and the material is very, very durable, the other thing I like is access. Your typical pack is basically uh, there's a flap on top, and you have to somehow get that uncinched, open up that flap, and dig in for what you want. And invariably, what you're digging for is always at the bottom. You've got a completely different way to get inside your packs. Yes, the uh, we, we call it the roll-top black hole is what you're referring to. So for us, we, uh, we put a zipper down the front of the bag from top to bottom, so that way you can open it, access from the bottom to the top with some pockets inside, We've also got other pockets on the bag, so every pocket is sealed separately from each other, so you can organize your gear, which is really nice. One thing about your zippers, uh, let's face it, uh, I've done a lot of backpacking. I've done some backpacking in the rain, and water gets through your standard zippers. Your standard zippers are not so standard. Yes, so the zipper that is in our bag is actually like a zipper you'd see in a dry suit. So it has rubber, it seals up tight, It's uh, you can actually inflate the bags in an emergency situation and float on them if you need to because the, the bags will hold air uh, because they're they're not seam taped they're uh, welded together and it's uh and the waterproof feature which makes it very nice so wow okay well that's a first i've never heard of a backpack that doubles as a life jacket but now i have now even though you've got packs of various sizes here uh, it's more than that. These packs are really part of a system. And let's start off with the harness. And I'm looking at this, and I'm immediately thinking of my old Army days when I was issued an Alice pack. And it's like, son, you got three choices. You can have a large frame, you can have a medium frame, or a small frame. This is completely different. It's completely customizable to the person that's going to wear it. Correct, yes, and that's very important. So when you're packing lots of weight, you want to be able to have the torso adjusted to you correctly so you can disperse the weight on your hips and your shoulders. And so we're not all created from the same mold, right? So different body types. So we wanted, when we built this system, we call it the Core Flex Harness. And it flexes with you because it's built out of carbon fiber and the torso adjusts very, very quickly. So that way you can adjust it to your torso and customize it to you. In addition to the harness system, we've got to talk about the pack frame itself. Uh, it looks really sturdy, but it's also really light, and I love the fact that there's a seat attached to it, too. What's that all about? Well, we uh, we spend a lot of time glassing when we're looking at wildlife and stuff, and, and the ground's usually wet or rough or bumpy and stuff like that. And uh, you know, when you're out there, your back sometimes hurts, and so it's nice to have a backrest. So when we uh, built our carbon fiber pack frame, we integrated a pad in the bottom so it can actually double as a chair or a seat for you to keep your your rear side dry and uh, and your back comfortable so you can enjoy the outdoors even more. All right, we're starting to run short on time, but folks, Rockman, R-O-K-M-A-N. Uh, I haven't seen these products in any stores. I know you're new. Where can folks find Rockman packs and all of this system that we're talking about here for use hunting, for use backpacking, for use on long rafting, canoeing excursions, or anything else? Well, we are a direct-to-consumer business, and so you can find us at rockmangear.com. Or if you, if you go to our website, you can actually find our events section where we're going to be. So sometimes we go to these sportsman shows, uh, and so you can, if you want to come and check out the pack there, put your hands on them, try them on, that's the place to do that. And Rockmangear.com, folks. That's R-O-K-M-A-N, gear.com, rockmangear.com. They're based in Idaho, but I'll tell you what, I'm looking at these packs. I think you're going to see them all over North America I think this is pretty groundbreaking, and I think a lot of folks who are in the backcountry are going to like what you've designed. Thanks for sharing this with us today on America Outdoors Radio, Zach. Thank you for your time.
you've heard me talk about Sportsman's Cove Lodge in Southeast Alaska before. And if you've listened to this show, you know I've been there as well. And I can vouch for how wonderful of an experience this is. When it comes to customer service, great food, scenic views, lots of wildlife, and most important of all, great fishing, Sportsman's Cove Lodge, you can't beat it. And that's why I'm really excited to tell you about a end-of-season special they are offering. You'll arrive September 6th, you'll fish from the 7th through the 10th, and depart on September 11th back to Ketchikan on a float plane where you'll catch your plane back home and bring all sorts of fish with you. What kind of fish? Silvers, also known as coho salmon, and they don't get any bigger than they do at this time of year. You'll also get to catch halibut, lingcod, true cod, yellow eye rockfish, and other bottom fish too. Bottom line is this, if you're looking for a sweet deal with an extra night stay, you've got to go to alaskasbestlodge.com, ask for the end of season special from September 6th through the 11th. There is one full boat left available, six slots. So do it for a group or do it for just a couple of you. Either way, you're going to love it. Go to alaskasbestlodge.com and hurry. This isn't going to last for long. Backcountry Hunters and Anglers seeks to ensure North America's outdoor heritage of hunting and fishing through education and work on behalf of wild public lands and waters. Lend your voice to the fight by visiting www.backcountryhunters.org and join the 25,000 men and women who have pledged to defend wildlife and public access. You can also demonstrate your support by signing up for the 2019 North American Rendezvous in Boise, Idaho, May 1st to the 5th. I fish lots of lakes, I fish them all year round Oh, I fish lots of lakes, everywhere I'm bound Can't say which lake's the best until I try All the rest going fishing, fishing, fishing All fish, maple lake, French lake, Grand lake, cedar lake, pleasant lake, clear lake, bass lake, otter lake, goose lake, gall lake, round lake, bear lake, rice lake, sugar lake, mud lake, long lake, and lake, swan lake, and lake of the woods Oh, I fish everywhere You're back with America Outdoors Radio and we're taking you to sunny San Diego that's where you'll find H&M Landing. The general manager for this company that offers some great sport fishing in the saltwater is Frank Ursetti. Frank, welcome to the show. John, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. So, Frank, H&M Landing, a long storied history. Why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about it and what you offer? John, H&M Landing here in San Diego offers the most diversified schedule of departures daily for offshore sport fishing and ecotourism adventures. We've been in business here in San Diego since 1935, and what started out as a small water taxi company has grown into a fleet of over 30 local and long-range vessels serving greater San Diego, as well as anglers from all over the world. Well, I'll tell you what, at this time of year... Uh, a chartered fishing trip out of San Diego sounds absolutely wonderful, where a lot of us are still digging out of some late winter snow. So let's break down the trips you offer, and we're going to start off small, and then we'll go big. Why don't you tell our listeners about the half-day and full-day trips you're offering and what you expect to be hot for the month of March and early part of April. Sure, John. Now, the, the half day is without a doubt the cornerstone marquee trip for H&M Landing. Every visitor that comes to San Diego typically does some of the tourist activities, but the, the must-do activity that they get in is a half-day fishing adventure. Here at H&M, we offer two trips daily. The first departs at 6.30 a.m., the next departs again at 1 p.m., Typically that time of year, we're fishing along the coast. We could be targeting species like early spring calico bass or delicious eating rockfish, potentially some barracuda and even a leftover winter yellowtail. You never know. Now, if you want a little bit more time on the water, we'd recommend a full-day Coronado Island trip. This trip departs a little bit earlier. It's about 12 hours in duration. It leaves at 5.30 and returns again at about 5.30 to 6 p.m. These trips fishing the Coronado Islands will be getting that first of the spring yellowtail as well as a little bit of bass and rockfish action. It's a great, great experience that offers just a little bit more time on the water. Frank, for some of our listeners back east, you might have to explain the difference between a yellowtail and a yellowfin tuna and why yellowtail are such a prized prey for anglers. 
Well, the yellowtail, that's a great question. The yellowtail is one of the cornerstone game fish here in San Diego, especially in the springtime. The yellowtail is more a member of the jack family, but again, a very prized game fish. These fish can range anywhere from a smaller one being a 10-pounder to some of the big home guards that can get up to 40 pounds. Now, when we talk about yellowfin tuna, again, a species of fish that the San Diego fleet has been built upon can range from small school-sized fish that are anywhere from 10 to 15 pounders to the big cows, the two 300 pounders that are highly sought after in the winter months as our long range fleet goes deep into Mexico. So there's a big difference between the two fish, but when we're talking about half and three quarter day trips, we can catch the yellow tail along the coast and at the islands and they are a highly prized and sought after game fish. Well, let's talk about trips for the more adventurous anglers, your overnight trips and your long-range trips. What do those look like? Sure, John. As we we get into March, we start to stretch our legs and start looking a little bit further offshore. We still have some of our fleet, primarily weekends, that are focusing on those longer trips, day to day and a half. Now, when I say day trip, it's an overnight trip, would be departing at 9 or 10 p.m., for instance, on a Friday night and returning the following evening at around 8 p.m. That would be considered a, an overnight or a day trip. The day and a half and two and a half day trips, we'll use the Friday night as an example again, would be departing for a day and a half trip on a Friday night. That trip would fish from sunup till sundown on Saturday and then return home to San Diego Sunday morning at 6 a.m. The two and a half adds another day to it, so Friday night, fishing Saturday all day, Sunday all day, and then returning home on Monday morning. This time of year, the guys could be fishing down along the coast, again, targeting yellowtail and delicious rockfish, or, like the last couple of years, we've seen some early season bluefin tuna, which is, is I, I say, uncharacteristic, but for the last four years, it's been the norm. Uh, we've been seeing some early catches of bluefin in the spring, so those trips could be targeting that as well. We're just going to have to wait until we get a little bit deeper uh, into the month before we see where our fleet's going to be setting their focus as they start to stretch offshore. Starting to run short on time, but before we go, uh, let's talk about what clients need to bring for these trips. Obviously, on the half-day trip, you're bringing your own food, drink, that sort of thing. But for the the day trips, the overnighters, the multi-day trips, uh, are you feeding them or are they feeding themselves? Sure, great question. All of our boats have full-service galleys, so breakfast, lunch, and on those longer trips, dinner, of course, snacks in between, um, hot and cold beverages. They range from mild to wild, whatever the customer's uh, taste might be. So if an angler's coming from some of those far-off places, one of the beauties here about San Diego, we are five minutes, H&M Landing, five minutes from San Diego Airport. We have many of our customers that literally fly in, hop on board, go fishing for a couple few days, get back to the air, get back in, head to the airport and fly home. They're very convenient if you don't have your own gear. We have a full service tackle shop. Anything from basic gear to multi-speed reels, we can get you outfitted for the trip of a lifetime. Last but not least, fish processing. Fish processing is handled On board and or for those who are on longer trips, we have shoreside processors that take care of that for you. They'll ship your fish direct to your front door, or you can pick it up at your local transportation center, such as your airport. All right, folks, bottom line is this. Sunny San Diego sounds like a great place to be, and fishing off the coast for all those different species sounds like a great way to spend a March or April afternoon. The website to go to to book your trip and find out more is hmlanding.com. That's hmlanding.com. Frank, do you have any parting words and any forecasts before we leave you today? Yes, yeah, certainly. HMLanding.com. We offer the most diversified schedule of trips, anything from half day to multi day springtime. Can't beat it. It's, it's a transitional time of year. However, it looks like this year the table's getting set. We're going to see the same thing. Some bluefin. I think we're going to see some late spring yellowtail that'll, that'll really start to perk here in March and April. So it's going to be a fun year. Sounds fantastic. Thanks, Frank. All right, John. Thank you. Stick around. We've got more fishing and hunting coming up on America Outdoors Radio. And we're going to end this segment the way we started, with a little fishing music from John Kurkowski. Make 
Maple Lake, French Lake, Grand Lake, Cedar Lake, Pleasant Lake, Clear Lake, Bass Lake, Cotter Lake, Goose Lake, Dull Lake, Round Lake, Pearl Lake, Rice Lake, Sugar Lake, Mud Lake, Long Lake, Ant Lake, Swan Lake, Lake of the Woods, oh, I fish everywhere. There's a place where the fishing is year-round, where the sun shines 300 days a year. The wineries and breweries are right downtown. The hiking and cycling offer spectacular views you just don't get in the big cities. Fortunately, the place is real and vibrant. It's the Dalles, Oregon, just 90 short minutes from Portland, along the gorgeous Columbia River, where the adventures are limited only by your imagination. Find out more at explorethedalles.com. Are you looking to reel in the marketing opportunity of a lifetime? America Outdoors Radio has sponsorships available, and we offer affordable platforms to reach thousands of listeners. Find out more by contacting John Cruz through his website at americaoutdoorsradio.com. Hello, I'm Mark Hempstreet, owner of Shiloh Inns. Shiloh is proud to be celebrating over 40 years of providing you, our valued Shiloh customers, with Shiloh's sincere friendliness, efficient customer service, and clean, comfortable, attractive, non-smoking rooms and suites, all at an affordable price. Shiloh also offers many free amenities like free Wi-Fi and free continental breakfast or hot, full, delicious breakfast at most Shiloh Inns, as well as pools, spas, steam, sauna rooms, exercise fitness facilities, and business centers. And even the kids stay free. And for you dog lovers, Shiloh is very dog friendly. So ask your best friend where he or she wants to stay. Next time you're traveling for business or pleasure, we think you'll get a pause up for Shiloh Inn. For reservations, call 1-800-222-2244 or visit our website at shilohinns.com. Shiloh Inns, affordable excellence. American family owned and proud of it. We're back with America Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz, and we are talking to Will Brantley. He's the hunting editor for Field and Stream Magazine, and he has put together a special report about declining turkey populations and with spring turkey hunting getting underway in many of our United States right now. This is a hot topic we need to talk about. Will, it's great to have you back on the air. Well, I appreciate you having me, John. So, Will, a lot of hunters, especially in the eastern half of our United States, will tell you there are a lot less turkey in the woods than there used to be, and you've got some numbers indicating they may be right. Why don't you share those numbers with us? Yeah, well, between uh, estimated population declines and some, uh, some, some estimated uh, harvest declines, which obviously the harvest declines are, are a little bit easier to get a, get a more concrete number, you look at some states, some traditional wild turkey strongholds, especially for, uh, for the eastern subspecies, Missouri, Mississippi, and New York, for example, those populations are estimated to be down 30, 34, and 40 percent, respectively. And then uh, biologists in Arkansas, actually suspect that the population is down 65% since the early 2000s. Some pretty, pretty startling numbers that, that have happened pretty quickly. You know, the, the peak turkey populations in the eastern United States were kind of in the early 2000s up through around 2005, things like that. And guys in this part of the world have been saying the last several years that they're seeing fewer turkeys strutting in fields, they're hearing fewer birds in the woods, and uh, the numbers seem to suggest that there's something to that interesting information here because as you know i live out west uh in the pacific northwest and out here it seems that turkey numbers seem to be on the rise and we have several different turkey species in this area we're not seeing that situation at all well and that's something that, that i alluded to briefly in the article but but yeah you're absolutely right and you know i i love to turkey hunt i would rather do that than anything and, and i travel quite a bit to turkey hunt uh I- including out west i haven't hunted in your neck of the woods but i go to nebraska every spring for example and i mean the turkeys are everywhere and and, and yeah this isn't these declines haven't been seen and felt by hunters all over the country they, they don't even seem to be uh, with all of the different turkey subspecies you know there are examples of it throughout the east United States, but that that seems to be where a lot of the decline is happening, particularly in the southeast and in uh, in some areas of the Midwest. But you know, uh, up in the Pacific Northwest, where you are, 
there have been some pretty recent wild turkey restoration efforts, and that's one of the things that um, that we saw in this part of the world too. You know, a lot of these states didn't have wild turkeys back in the '50s and '60s, and you know, when agencies, uh, with help of the NWTF, started restocking them into places, what you saw was a really quick population boom and and you saw a lot of these birds and that's when we had that that heyday of those high populations in the late 90s early 2000s and uh now that kind of seems to be going away so i hope that's not the same trend that you guys see out in your neck of the woods especially for the guys who like to turkey hunt as much as i do but it's kind of the you know it's kind of the thing that that seemed to happen around here Well, let's talk about some of the other reasons why the eastern half of the U.S. are seeing declines. And in the article, you mentioned poult production and poult survival is a key factor. Tell our listeners more. Well, when you you talk to turkey biologists, I mean, hunters, we like to look at things and and blame things when, when we have a tough season. But, you know, at the end of the day... Uh, what drives game bird numbers is uh, recruitment. And on the issue of pole production especially, turkey nests are pretty fragile. Yeah, they, they are susceptible to a lot of predators, but more than that, uh, you get a, a rainy, cold spring, and a lot of turkey nests just don't survive. And, and we've had a lot of rainy, cold springs here the last few years, and, and that can result in a, in a large-scale poor hatch. So like you look at um, Kentucky, for example. They try to track a, um, I'm trying to find this number here, a poult per hen recruitment rate. And our turkey biologist, Zach Danks, told me that the the break even number for for sustaining our turkey population year to year is two poults per hen. Uh, in other words, a hen just needs to raise two poults every spring and, and our population won't go up, it won't go down. But we haven't had that two poults per hen number in the last couple of years. So that's something that's concerning and unfortunately uh, biologists don't have a lot of concrete answers. They have a lot of things that it could be. Um, weather, obviously, is a big one. Potential uh, nest mortality from raccoons, possums, skunks, coyotes, any variety of predators that are out there. And then also pulp mortality after they hatch. And that's something that hasn't been studied as much, but it's long been assumed that, that a lot of things prey on baby turkeys. But they haven't really been able to study what happens to a, to a baby turkey in the first few weeks of its life. And there's actually a research student at the University of Tennessee, Vinnie Johnson, who is working on some of that stuff right now with some tiny transmitters that he's, uh, that he's affixing to poults and kind of studying what happens to them in those first two weeks of life before they're able to fly. You mentioned that hunters blame a lot of things and a lot of people when turkey hunting, or for that matter, any hunting, doesn't go well. Now, when it comes to bighorn sheep out west, uh, they're very susceptible to disease, especially from domestic sheep. I have heard, and I read in your article, that some folks are blaming the decline in turkey populations on chickens, or specifically chicken manure. Yeah, you know, that's been uh, something that I've seen on social media, on hunting forums, and, and especially with, with hunters in the southeast. We, we have a lot of commercial poultry operations, and, and people have rightfully wondered, um, you know, the manure from those operations is, is frequently broadcast on the crop fields around here as fertilizer, and people have wondered, like, you know, hey, uh, are there diseases in that chicken manure that our turkeys are picking up? And uh, the University of Tennessee actually conducted a study on that, trying to link it to a parasite, I believe it's called blackhead and uh, trying to compare whether uh, uh, turkeys raised on substrate from a chicken house had a, had a higher prevalence of that. And uh, the results of the test were really kind of inconclusive. They didn't really prove it one way or the other. So at the end of the day, it's something that, you know, um, they haven't been able to prove that, that turkeys are picking up diseases out of chicken manure. But, you know, there have been chicken houses on the landscape for a long time, too. So I, I think a lot of biologists are probably skeptical of that. But They don't know for sure that that's not a problem. One other thing that you point out in the article, you know, the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, their tagline is hunting is conservation. We all know that hunting is a great wildlife management tool. But when it comes to setting turkey hunting seasons, we may be setting them in a way that's harmful to turkey populations. Explain that. 
Well, you know, I, I think it's always important for, for us as hunters to always look at our regulations and, uh, and look at the big picture of, of what role we play in wildlife management. You know, in a lot of the states where there have been really sharp declines, have very early season openers and very high bag limits on, on gobblers. And it's always been assumed, or turkey biologists have, have long assumed that, you know, uh, gobbler mortality didn't have much of an effect on the overall turkey production so long as the hens were on the nest when most of that mortality occurred. And hunters are the number one source of mortality on adult gobblers. I mean, an adult gobbler is a pretty formidable critter, and, and not many predators are able to catch it. But now in the in the shadow of these declines, some people are starting to wonder, you know, hey, are we maybe killing a few too many turkeys? And, you know, we're in a situation where turkey hunting tactics have evolved a great deal. Just within the past decade, we have decoys that look better than ever. We have guns that have twice the effective range that they had when I was starting out turkey hunting, blinds that let us hunt in the rain. And I take advantage of all of that stuff and have written about all that stuff and, and enjoy using it. But the fact is, it has made it a little bit easier to kill a turkey in the past decade or so. So as we look at those things in the face of some of these declines, it's okay for us as hunters to ask ourselves, like, you know, hey, uh, do we need to adjust some of these things? Do we need to adjust a few bag limits in some of these problem places until we at least get a handle on some other factors that might be causing these declines? Lots of food for thought when it comes to reasons why turkey populations are declining in the eastern half of the United States. If you want to read this special report, you'll find it in the current edition of Field & Stream magazine. Look for it at a newsstand near you, or better still, just subscribe to Field & Stream magazine. It doesn't cost much to do so, and you'll get a whole year's worth of the outdoors when you do. Will, always a pleasure to talk to you on America Outdoors Radio. Yeah, John, I appreciate it. We've been telling you about Sportsman's Cove Lodge in southeast Alaska for a while now, and there's a reason. They are the only Alaska lodge we talk about on this show. It's because they're truly Alaska's best lodge. The adventure starts with a float plane ride from Ketchikan, after which you'll get the chance to experience some of the best hospitality, food, and wonderful people you'll ever meet. Wildlife is abundant, from bears and deer to eagles and whales, and let's not forget the reason you're here, the fishing. Halibut, salmon, lingcod, rockfish, true cod, and more. It's all waiting for you in abundance at Sportsman's Cove Lodge. Book your trip today at Alaska's Best Lodge Com. That's Alaska's Best Lodge.com for Sportsman's Cove Lodge. Looking to reel in the marketing opportunity of a lifetime? Then set the hook because we've got it right here. America Outdoors Radio has sponsorships available, and we offer an affordable platform to reach thousands of listeners interested in fishing, hunting, and the outdoors. Find out more by contacting host John Cruz through his website at AmericanOutdoorsRadio.com. That's AmericanOutdoorsRadio.com. But hurry, if you wait too long, this big opportunity might just get away. That's AmericanOutdoorsRadio.com. There's a place where the fishing is year-round, where the sun shines 300 days a year. The wineries and breweries are right downtown. The hiking and cycling offer spectacular views you just don't get in the big cities. Fortunately, the place is real and vibrant. It's the Dalles, Oregon, just 90 short minutes from Portland, along the gorgeous Columbia River, where the adventures are limited only by your imagination. Find out more at explorethedalles.com. There's no more majestic, magical, adventuresome country than the Western United States of America to enjoy a great family vacation. Hello, I'm Mark Hemstreet, owner of Shiloh Inns. Shiloh Inns are still offering affordable four-star accommodations at two-star prices. Enjoy deluxe smoke-free suites, spacious pools and spas, and fully equipped fitness centers. From free high-speed internet in every room to a free continental breakfast or full hot delicious breakfast at most Shiloh Inns. There are no hidden fees like some of the big chain hotels charge. 
even the kids stay free. And Shiloh Inns are dog friendly. For reservations, call 1-800-222-2244 or visit our website at shilohinns.com. Shiloh Inns, affordable excellence. American family owned and proud of it. Backcountry Hunters and Anglers seeks to ensure North America's outdoor heritage of hunting and fishing through education and work on behalf of public lands and waters. Lend your voice to the fight today by visiting backcountryhunters.org or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You're back with America Outdoors Radio, and I've got some good news to share with you as a hunter or angler, and surprisingly, it's coming out of Washington, D.C., where the House and Senate have passed a bill called the Natural Resources Act that the backcountry hunters and anglers, along with many other conservation organizations, is calling the most significant conservation legislation passed by Congress in a decade. The biggest part of this bill is the permanent reauthorization of the Land and Water Conservation Fund with 3% dedicated to securing hunting and fishing access opportunities on public lands and waters. Previously, this bill was only passed for a year or two at a time and was caught up in political wrangling that delayed funding for conservation and outdoor recreation throughout the country. This is now largely fixed due to Democrats and Republicans coming together on this issue. Other parts of the bill include the establishment of the Frank and Gene Moore Wild Steelhead Special Management Area in Oregon, a permanent mineral withdrawal in Washington State's Methow Valley and the La Immigrant Crevice near Yellowstone National Park, the California Desert Protection and Recreation Act, protections for the Cerro del Yuda and Rio San Antonio Wilderness Areas in New Mexico, and reauthorization of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program at current funding levels until 2022, as well as the reauthorization of the Migratory Bird Conservation Act at $6.5 million until 2022, a $2.6 million increase. A special thanks, by the way, goes to Senators Lisa Murkowski from Alaska and Maria Cantwell from Washington State for helping to get this bill to the president's desk, where it's now waiting for his signature. Next on America Outdoors Radio, it's never too early to think about upland bird hunting. And one place you might want to go this season is the state of Nebraska because they've got a special upland slam program that they have initiated. Last year was the inaugural year with Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever. With us here to tell you more about it is Alicia Harden, the Wildlife Division Administrator for Nebraska Games and Parks Commission. Alicia, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. I'm glad to be on. So, Alicia, you're going to have to help me out here. Now, when I think of Nebraska, I think of the Cornhusker State. So I think I've got one of the birds down. That would be the ring-necked pheasant. But what are the other three birds that make up the slam? Right. I mean, ring-neck pheasants obviously are a standby in Nebraska, but the other three species that we have are the northern bobwhite quail, the sharp-tailed grouse, and the greater prairie chicken. Quail, uh, very how do you say this, adaptable species that as long as they have any sort of cover, they seem to do well. I'd imagine those are pretty common in Nebraska. As for the sharp-tailed grouse, the prairie chickens, are those pretty common in Nebraska in terms of huntable numbers and seasons? Absolutely. We have a really amazing part of our state called the Sand Hills part of Nebraska, and there's a lot of grass-covered rolling sand dunes. Uh, they, it's great blocks of native prairie, which those two particular species, the greater prairie chicken and the sharp-tailed grouse, really do prefer. So we do have great huntable populations, especially of those two. Well, you just answered my next question, where to go. We should talk about seasons as well. When it comes to the prairie chicken, when it comes to the grouse, are we talking a September 1st opener for planning purposes? Yes. Our seasons for sharp tail and prairie chicken start on September 1st and go through January 31st. And uh, our pheasant and quail start on the last Saturday in October, so that depends on what year you're in. I think next year they start October 27th in 2019. 
and they run through January 31st. All right. Well, you told us where to look for the prairie chickens and the sharp-tailed grouse. Uh, what are some of the better places in the state of Nebraska to look for pheasant, to look for quail, not just to get one, but to maybe get a limit? Well, I'll tell you, you know, pheasants are found throughout the state. We definitely have some parts of the state that you'll find, you know, maybe more numbers of them. And that would be in the southwest part of the state and in the panhandle. Um, although, again, you'll find the pheasants throughout the state. We also have quite a bit of land that's open to public walk-in hunting in the southwest. So that's also pretty convenient to go. As far as quail, we have uh, quail again, are, are a lot in, in a lot of part of the state, uh, but mostly we'll find them in the southern part of the state, uh, from the southeast all the way to the southwest. So again, kind of sticking more close to the Kansas border. And we have, again, public land plentiful in, in those areas where you can go hunting. Well, I love the fact that there's a lot of public lands to hunt. And I'll tell you what, this sounds like a lot of fun, either planning two hunting vacations, one in September, one in late October, early November, uh, to fill that slam, or maybe just trying to do it all at once at the end of October and early November. So this sounds like a lot of fun. How many people actually signed up for the first year and how many people actually completed their slam? We had about 260 hunters participate in the program, and we had 140 of them actually finish it. So what do you get if you finish the slam? Well, this year, because we had this great partnership with the Nebraska chapter of Pheasants Forever, they were able to get either a Browning 12-gauge semi-automatic shotgun, a Pheasants Forever print, or a Yeti cooler. Um, and in addition to that, as they're making their submissions, they're sending in these pictures of their birds and the counties that they took them, and then we'll send back a certificate and a really nice pen for them to have for the memory of getting their slam. We probably need to clarify something here. Everybody gets a certificate in the pen, uh, but as for the Yeti cooler, the shotgun, the print, uh, you're entered for a chance to win one of those prizes in a drawing. Is that right? That's correct. <laughs> I was really excited, thinking that I was going to get all three if I went to Nebraska and played my slam. You can be entered into the drawing, and that's what we did for the 2018-19 season. Again, just to be clear, if you completed the slam, you were entered for a chance to win the shotgun, the print, or the Yeti cooler, and only one was given away to each lucky winner. But hey, the odds were pretty good last year, and I suspect they'll be pretty good next year, too. Okay, so here's the next question. Uh, this was a good success for the first year. You're getting the word out now for next year. Sounds like you're going to do it again for the 2019-2020 season. Yeah, we really are hopeful that we can keep this going. We've had such great participation, ages from 13 to 79. And we've even had a couple folks that finished it. Well, we had one guy that finished it in one day. Wow. Uh, so we are really looking forward to what this is providing, especially promoting the great mix bag hunting opportunities and really letting people know that there's a lot of other species in Nebraska that you can hunt. We had uh, several folks that had never hunted some of these species, especially the prairie chicken and the sharp-tailed grouse. There you go, folks. Nebraska. If it's not a destination for you already, you now have a reason to make it one. The Upland Slam, where you can get some really great bragging rights, a certificate, a pin, and a chance to win some cool swag. They'll announce what the prices are for next year, later this year. In the meantime, just check the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission website for details as the season approaches. Alicia, thanks for sharing this with us today on America Outdoors Radio. Thanks, Don. I don't know where this hour goes every week, but once again, we're running short on time and we've got to start wrapping things up. I would tell you that if you like to listen to the show online, one place you can do it is on TalkAmericaRadio.us. It's the new voice for conservative talk radio. It's online radio and we are part of their schedule every Saturday morning from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern Time. You can also listen on demand anytime you want at Stitcher or Podbean. Just subscribe to America Outdoors Radio. And you can hear both this show and our sister show on YouTube. Just subscribe to Northwestern Outdoors. That's one word to hear us on that channel. Finally, don't forget to follow us on Facebook and check out our website every week for previews of upcoming shows. I do hope you're blessed in the days ahead, and I hope 
that you'll be able to enjoy some spring weather much sooner than later. Until next time, do remember, it's your country in your outdoors. So get out there and enjoy it. One little postscript as we end the show, and that is a reminder about that special deal being offered by Sportsman's Cove Lodge. You get yourself to Ketchikan, Alaska, and from there, you're going to spend five nights at this wonderful lodge where there's actually more staff members than there are guests. There is a full boat, six slots available for their very last day of the season. You'll arrive at the lodge by float plane from Ketchikan on September 6th. You'll fish four days from the 7th through the 10th for silvers. Lots of silvers. This is expected to be a great year and they'll be bigger at this time of year than any other time of year. And don't forget, you'll be bringing home halibut, lingcod, true cod, yellow eye rockfish, and other rockfish too. You'll get to spend an extra night as well because you're the last guest of the season. Find out more about booking this special end of season stay by going to alaskasbestlodge.com. That's alaskasbestlodge.com for Sportsman's Cove Lodge and their end of season deal arriving September 6th and departing September 11th.